Good evening. I'm Dr. Kathleen Ray, and tonight I have the pleasure of being here with my esteemed colleague, Dr. William Burnett. And we're here to talk about psychological testing that distinguishes parental alienation from parental estrangement. Additionally, we were provided some questions from various audience members, and we're going to do our very best to answer as many of those as we possibly can. So let's get started. Well, the first topic is to be able to distinguish uh, parental alienation from estrangement. Sometimes people get those two terms mixed up, but just to be on the same page, let's make sure that we're all saying the same thing. So alienation refers to situations in which a child rejects a parent without a good reason. And usually uh, the child's rejection is far out of proportion to anything that that parent has done. And usually the rejection is promoted and, and encouraged by the preferred parent or the favored parent. On the other hand, estrangement refers to situations in which a child rejects a parent and there is a good reason. For instance, there's a history of abuse or neglect. And so it's understandable why the child doesn't want to see that parent. So today, uh, Dr. Ray and I are going to talk about some of the reasons of some of the research that uh, helps to uh, form the basis of parental alienation theory. In other words, uh, what kind of research exists that helps to show that parental alienation really exists and that it can be determined in a uh, reliable and valid manner. So the first step is to make sure that we're all having the same definitions. And I want to make sure that you're aware of an article that was published about a year ago in an important journal called the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And this article is about the five-factor model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. And it itemizes the five components of the five things that we need to have in order to make this diagnosis. Many of you are familiar with this. These five things, um, the, all five of them have been around for many, many years. But um, Dr. Amy Baker and I put them together in this list that, that puts them all uh, together in one system or one model. And what we call this, it, it's called sometimes the five-factor model, or it's sometimes called the Baker model for the diagnosis of parental alienation. So let's go through the five factors that you can see on your slide. First of all, the child rejects a relationship or avoids a relationship with one of the parents. So that's a fundamental thing that we need to see in these cases. Number two, even though the child rejects a relationship now, there previously was a good relationship between the child and that parent who is now rejected. Third, that there's an absence of abuse, neglect, or seriously deficient parenting on the part of the parent who is now rejected. Fourth, having to has to do with the uh, preferred parent. That is, uh, there are multiple alienating behaviors manifested by the a favored or the preferred parent. And fifth, the child exhibits many of the eight manifestations of parental alienation. So in doing research, uh, generally focuses, you don't generally focus on all five of those things at the same time. Most of the research has to do with factor four, which are the alienating behaviors manifested by the favored parent, or factor five, which are the eight uh, classic and well-known behaviors manifested by alienated children. And so today, Dr. Ray and I are mainly talking about research that has to do with factor five. So we're going to explain several different research projects and go into a little bit of detail on each one so that you kind of understand the significance of, of that project. And all of these have to do with factor five, that is the eight behavioral signs of parental alienation. And so sometimes you can think about factor five from the point of view of an observer, for instance, from the point of view of an evaluator or the point of view of a parent. You can also think about factor five, that is the behaviors of the child, 
from the point of view of the child. So Dr. Ray is going to start out with a research project in which factor five, that it's the behaviors of the child, but they're, they're from the perspective or the point of view of the parent. Okay, so Dr. Burnett just talked about the five factors and factor five refers to the behaviors of the child. In 2019, Gina Rowland's paper titled Parental Alienation, a Measurement Tool, was published in the Journal of Divorce and Remarriage. Now, Gina Rowland's questionnaire, the Rowland's Parental Alienation Scale, um, also referred to as the RPAS, pertains to the behaviors of, of the child. They pertain to factor five, except from the point of view of the parents. 592 parents filled out her questionnaire regarding their children's behaviors. And Roland's scale was basically designed to capture Gardner's eight domains of parental alienation behaviors. Now, during the data analysis stage of her study, Roland used a very powerful tool called a factor analysis, which simply uh, or simplifies complex data, finds hidden patterns or what I like to refer to as little hidden gems, and sets the stage for a deeper, more focused analysis. Roland's factor analysis basically boiled it down to six factors. And five of her factors are exactly the same as Gardner's. One, a campaign of denigration towards the alienated parent. Two, the independent thinker phenomenon. Three, reflexive support. Four, presence of world scenarios. And five, the spread of animosity to extended family. Her sixth factor was lack of positive effect toward the alienated parent. So overall, Roland's study demonstrated that parents who reported either that a court evaluation or court finding had confirmed the presence of parental alienation scored much higher on all six RPAS factors, as well as on the overall RPAS score. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. First, Rollins focuses on the behaviors of the child from the perspective of the parent. And second, she didn't use the term splitting. It isn't on her list. However, she did add to five of Gardner's factors. Now, let's take a brief look at Dr. Amy Baker's survey or questionnaire that focuses on the behaviors from the perspective of the child. And that's a really interesting difference. She administered it to 20 kids and she administered it to 20 kids in one group and 20 kids in another group. And they were in both groups, the kids were administered 28 questions. And as you'll see on the PowerPoint, the BAAQ consists of questions such as, do you enjoy spending time with your mom or dad? If your mother or father do not agree, who's usually right? How do you feel about your parents, mom or dad's family, or your grandparents, or your aunts, uncles, cousins on so and so side of the family? So, those were just some of the questions that she used. And of the 40 children, 35 of those cases, which turned out to be 87.5%, were correctly classified. What we'd like to do now is to shift to a, a different research uh, that we did a few years ago. And in fact, Dr. Ray and I were both involved in this research project. You can see the two articles that we published. They were both published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. One, the first one you can see is called An Objective Measure of Splitting in Parental Alienation, the Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire. And the second article a year or so later was called Measuring the Difference between parental alienation and parental estrangement, the PARC, the P-A-R-Q gap. By the way, all these articles we're talking about today, uh, if you need a copy, you can contact uh, either me or Dr. Ray and we can send you a copy. So this um, this time we're still talking about uh, the, the, the symptoms of parental alienation from the point of view of the child. That's the person who's being questioned or tested. 
And we're also addressing, uh, you know, we started out by, by mentioning the eight uh, behavioral signs of parental alienation. And here they are again. You know, they start with the campaign of Denegade, Rachel, and so on. So what's interesting about this, this research is we focus on one specific one, which you're now seeing is the lack of ambivalence, or sometimes called splitting. Uh, which is a particular symptom that's very common in uh, alienated children. Splitting refers to a psychological mechanism in which a person uh, sees uh, one person or one kind of situation as totally, totally good, and the other one is totally, totally bad. And that's what we mean by splitting. And that occurs in certain patients with patients with certain kinds of mental disorders. And it occurs prominently in um, children with parental alienation. Actually, what's interesting about this particular behavior is that it might not be observed by the parents. In other words, if you see the child in an everyday situation, you can see how the child reacts to the, to the two parents, but you don't typically elicit the 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 child's opinion directly. But that is something that a custody evaluator can do, that a, a person who knows how to do an evaluation of these children can ask questions in a certain way. Uh, just as an example, you can ask a series of questions that have to do with tell me about your mom, things you like, things you don't like, tell me about your dad, things you like, things you don't like. And you can see if you put all this together, you can see that the child considers one parent really, really good and the other one uh, not so good or not good at all. In fact, I, I literally had a child who told me, mother is my angel, my dad is my devil. So that's a pretty vivid example of splitting expressed literally by a child. So um, we used this questionnaire called the PARC, the Parental Alienate the Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire. Um, and here are a few questions. Here are some examples of some questions that show up on this, on this questionnaire. For instance, um, I, I, instance, it might say, uh, my father loves me a lot, or this, this parent loves me a lot, or this parent doesn't pay any attention to me. So some of these questions are positive, some of them are negative. And there's a series of questions about the mother and a series of questions about the father. This is called the Park Questionnaire. This has been used for many, many years. Dr. Ray and I did not invent or develop or create this questionnaire. It, it was developed maybe 30 years ago and has been translated into many languages and has been used in 30 or 40 different countries. In other words, it's, it, it's extremely validated and a reliable uh, psychological instrument. But we were able to use it for testing children who had been alienated or those who had not, and to see if they were different. So here are some, some features of the parental acceptance ex rejection questionnaire. Um, first of all, it's filled out by the child. It's a self-report that measures the child's perception of their parent. Does the parent see me in, ex in an accepting way or, or a rejecting way? Does the parent treat me with acceptance or rejection? This is scored quantitatively, of course, and just to, so you know what's coming up, the, the lowest possible score is, is 60, and the highest possible score is 240 on this questionnaire. And a very, very low score is a very positive perception of the parent and a high school is a very negative perception of a parent. So let me show you the next slide, which uh, shows you the uh, information about the participants in this research study and the parents. We had a good number. We had more than 40 uh, children who had been alienated, severely alienated from their children, and uh, a number of children who were in control groups who had not been alienated. Now, this is something that Dr. Ray and I uh, participated in together because she had a program for the treatment of alienated children. And so she actually provided the, uh, the subjects 
who were the severely alienated children, the 46 children. So, some of them were alienated from their mother, some were alienated from their father. And just as a little detail, they all came from different families. You know, doing research of this type, it's best not to have children all from the same family because uh, that can confound the results of those particular children. So uh, Dr. Ray had children, uh, sometimes multiple children from one family, but in order to, to keep the research on a more legitimate plane, we, we only used one child from each family from 46 families. So those children came from uh, Dr. Ray's own treatment program. The other children came from a very um, useful national data bank of people who like to part who want to participate or who volunteer to participate in, in different kinds of medical and psychological research. So they were from all over the United States. There are people who uh, we announced this study and there are people who signed up for themselves and for their children to participate in this project. So we ended up with a really good sample of children who were severely alienated and children who were not able, alienated. And I'm not gonna go through all the different statistics, but I wanna show you a slide with the, the end result. And this slide shows that, the, that this test, the PARC, and we have a particular variation of it called the PARC gap, it distinguishes severely alienated from non-alienated children. And what you can see in this, this is kind of a neat chart. This is, this is the end result of this study. The bars in red are the children on the right side of this chart, and they're the children who are severely alienated. And they had very high scores on this test, which meant that they engaged in splitting. That is, they perceived their one parent as very in very uh, positive way and the other parent very negative. And this happened whether it was the alienated mother or the alienated father, that in either case, the, the preferred parent had very, very low scores and the rejected parent had very, very high scores. So that they're the red children, the red bars on the right side of this graph, on this chart. On the left side, in blue, are, the, uh, are all the other children. In other words, all the children who were not uh, alienated from their parents. And they all had very low scores on this particular measure on comparing the mother and the father. If you look closely, there's actually one red spot on the left side of the of the chart. And that was a girl who, who was alienated from her parent, but who actually had a score that was in the more normal range. So that's interesting. You know, that's sort of an exception to the overall study, which is fine. Because if you count all of these subjects up together, it, they were 99% accurate. That is the PARC, the P-A-R-Q, was 99% accurate in distinguishing alienated from non-alienated children. So let me mention a couple of conclusions. You know, why are we doing all this? Why would we do this research? And what are the, what are the implications? Well, of course, the most obvious implication here is that this rather simple test, which a child does, you, you can either do it on pencil paper or you can do it on the computer. It's not scored by subjectively, it's scored objectively with numbers. And that this test distinguishes alienated from non-alienated children with a very high degree of accuracy. Now, this does not mean that we would use this test all by itself. In, in any situation like this, we would use the PARC as one part of a comprehensive evaluation of the family. And But if you do use it, what we would say is that the PARC is useful, as I say here, useful for both clinicians and also forensic practitioners in evaluating children of divorced parents. So that's um, that was a pretty meaningful um, project that Dr. Ray and I did together. Um, and it's it's available if you have any need for it. Well, we can easily send you papers. By the way, uh, if you're a clinician, you, uh, we, we, we can't actually send you the test, but if you if you contact us, we'll tell you how to get the test 
if you want to use it in your own practice. So that's an example of focusing on factor five of the five factor model. Within factor five, the uh, behaviors of the child, within that specifically, the uh, the one of the eight factor, one of the eight behaviors which involves uh, lack of, of uh, ambivalence or splitting. So, you know, this this is only looking at one piece of the whole method for evaluating um, children who might be alienated. But that that's that's a good way to do a project is just to kind of deconstruct it and focus on one piece at a time. So there's another research project that involves splitting that uh, Dr. Ray is going to summarize. Thank you, Bill. In 2018, Blag and Godfrey published their research titled Exploring Parent-Child Relationships in Alienated versus Neglected or Emotionally Abused Children Using the Family Relations Test. Now, of significance, uh, Dr. Burnett and I published our first paper online, and these researchers in England saw it. And Blag and Goffrey immediately wrote their paper based on data that they had already collected. Now, they used the Bain-Anthony Family Relations Test to see if there were differences between alienated and neglected or emotionally abused children's views and feelings towards their mothers and fathers. The results of their study basically replicated and complemented the results of our study. Their study demonstrated that alienated children engaged in splitting, idealizing their preferred parent, and demonizing their target parent without legitimate justification. So these are extremely strong results. And the main differences between Blag and Godfrey's study and ours are the following. Number one, a different test was used. And number two, it's a different population that they studied. And number three, it was conducted in a different country. Here's one other thing I want to point out. The findings from Blag and Godfrey's research underscore the significance of not simply accepting children's stated wishes at face value. Similarly, I've thought about this a lot, and I strongly maintain that the two papers that Dr. Burnett and I collaborated on regarding splitting further underscore the importance of not blindly accepting children's expressed wishes in high conflict divorce situations. Specifically, when children express the desire to reside with one parent and spend no time with the other parent, the children cannot see anything positive about the parent whom they ref refuse to spend time with. Okay, now you may be asking, what's the point of all this? Is there any point of all this? Well, of course, the answer is yes. Quantitative research helps to prove parental alienation really exists. In other words, it has face validity. And two, it's possible to distinguish parental alienation from other causes of contact refusal. And that is scientifically referred to as discriminant validity. Back to you, Dr. Burnett. Okay, we're going to switch gears now. We've been talking about several examples of research having to do with distinguishing alienated from non-alienated children. We've been focusing in particular on factor five of the five-factor model or the Baker model, um, which has to do with the behaviors of the child. So that that's an example of the kind of research. Incidentally, this is really just kind of a very small sample of research projects, of, you know, there, there, there have been more than a hundred research projects published in peer-reviewed journals that, that, that are important to know about. But uh, Dr. Ray and I focused on a few uh, to give examples. And now we're gonna switch gears and we'd like to address some of the questions from the audience that have been sent in in the last few weeks. So um, 
uh, we, we're going to show you these questions, uh, actually visually, and Dr. Ray is going to uh, respond to some of them, and I'm going to respond to some of them. So, so let's read this together. This is the, uh, a slide that has uh, the first couple of questions that I'm going to talk about. Let's read this together. Question for Dr. Burnett. Can the park be used in court as a reliable measure as to whether parental alienation exists? Is it reliable and valid as a way to differentiate parental alienation from estrangement? So uh, there's a related question. Uh, let's, so let's, let's go through that also. How useful might the results of such testing be in court, for example, in determining the existence or severity of parental alienation? And how might this information be best presented to either evaluators or the court to convey the desired message? So first of all, the general, the, the general answer to, is that yes, uh, this is a powerful, legitimate uh, psychological test or measure, and yes, it can be presented in court. But uh, sometimes courts just say, here, testify, uh, tell, tell us uh, the results of your test. But sometimes the court requires the uh, presenter or the expert witness to justify or to prove that the information that's being presented is scientific. And so that can be done. There are several ways you do that. One is, uh, is that does this test have a, a measure of success? In other words, how accurate is this test in measuring a particular thing? And the park is unusually accurate at least in the uh, research that uh, Dr. Ray and I did, it was 99% accurate in, in separating severely alienated from non-alienated children. That doesn't mean it's perfect, and it does not mean that it should be used all by itself. I don't think I would ever go to court and testify about this test or anything else all by itself, is that it's, it's one component of a much broader um, child custody evaluation that consists of interviewing the parents, interviewing the child, usually once with one parent, once with the other parent, doing this and other psychological tests, uh, uh, collecting information from other people and so on. So please don't get the idea that any of these tests can be used all by themselves. But anyway, to prove that this is scientific, there are other measures. Uh, has it been published? Has the test been published in uh, peer-reviewed journals, and yes, yes, it has. Uh, has it been used previously in other court cases? And sometimes you can show that yes, it has. Um, is it generally accepted? Well, that's hard, kind of hard to measure for a test that's relatively new, but uh, almost all the people that uh, I've heard from think that this is a very useful test. So those are, those are some of the examples of the kinds of things that come up. Well, the other part of this question was, um, how would this be presented, either in court or not even in court, but just to the person who's doing the evaluation? Well, I, I think the uh, if you're in that position, the thing to do is to get a copy of the test of, of the of the uh, not a copy of the test, but a copy of these articles that we've been presenting. In other words, the, we we talked about several different tests, and you can get you can get uh, the published results, the published paper of uh, any one of these tests that you think would be good to use. And you can give the published paper to the evaluator. Uh, and, and hopefully the evaluator will see that this seems like a good thing to do and will incorporate the test. And you might have to educate the evaluator if the evaluator does not already know about the PARC or the um, Benet, let me tell you the, the Benet Anthony test, or the test by Dr. Baker, or the test by, uh, what was that first one? Roland, the Roland test. The, they might not know about it, so you might have to educate them by giving them the, uh, the paper that's been published. Occasionally, you might be in a position of educating the court, especially if you're an attorney and, and you have access to saying things directly to the court, is you can, uh, you, you know, you can suggest to the court that these tests exist. Now, the court, it's unlikely that a court is going to order that a specific 
test be used, but but the court might take that into consideration in just trying to decide whether or not to even have a custody evaluation performed in this particular case. So to answer your question, yes, we think these should be used in court. We think that evaluators should be encouraged to use all four of these tests. And if, if you do run into questions, please contact Dr. Ray or me, and we'll try to help you sort it out. So Dr. Ray uh, has a couple of questions here that she's going to address. How can I get my judge to order the park test? And the answer to this question can vary dependent on where you live geographically and the rules of the court. You can explain it to the judge, but you don't order it all by itself, as previously discussed by Dr. Burnett. If you are a parent who believes that you are being alienated by your child and ex, then I would suggest that you and your legal representative need to get a judge to order a full comprehensive custody evaluation, not a partial custody evaluation. And judges don't ordinarily order specific tests. The judge might indirectly acknowledge a test or refer to it. Judges order the evaluation. So the custody evaluator will administer a battery of tests to various family members. And you and or your legal representative can certainly mention the park to the evaluator and hopefully they will be familiar with it and have received proper training to administer it. And if they haven't, perhaps the evaluator will be open to obtaining contact information, perhaps from me or Dr. Burnett. Um, in particular, I provide one-to-one -one training and group workshops for mental health professionals, particularly those who are child custody evaluators, on how to administer the park and evaluate the test results. Another question that has been asked is, is there any correlation between the PARC and the MMPI2? I don't see any correlation between the two tests. They are both potentially helpful, however. Another question is, does your family reunification program, the Family Reflections Reunification Program, um, is is the one that I have, uh, does it involve adult children in their late 30s? And the answer to that is yes, we accept almost any age except for kids who are below age five. Now, in the case that the, um, the person who is, you know, older uh, or in their <laughs> mid 30s, um, if, if it's strictly for a person like uh, at that age, then obviously they're not a minor. And so it would not need to be court ordered to get into our program. However, if there are siblings who are still minors and the 35 year old sibling is interested in also uh, going through the reunification process, we would require a court order for the minor children, and then the 35-year-old would need to uh, voluntarily decide on coming to our program. And if you would like more information about the program, uh, you can look it up online. It's familyreflectionsprogram.com. Another question that a viewer has asked is this. Is it possible for psychological assessments to be manipulated? And if yes, how can this be mitigated? Yes, it's possible that psych assessments can be manipulated. For example, the MMPI-2 is commonly used to assess both parents during custody evaluations. And it's important to keep in mind that approximately 98% of severely alienating parents have a personality disorder or at least personality traits, typically cluster B, narcissistic, antisocial, and borderline. The alienating parent tends to present very well. They are characteristically charming, master manipulators, cool, calm, collected. They're likable. 
they know how to manage first impressions, and they're actually rather good at engineering things. And as such, alienating parents commonly attempt to manipulate their MMPI2 responses. The MMPI2 has four validity scales that specifically address faking well adjusted. And one of the scales, the L scale, refers to the lie scale, which was initially designed to detect a deliberate attempt to present oneself in a favorable light. It's possible that a custody evaluator can manipulate the results of the test if inexperienced or not PA savvy. On the other hand, the target parent is a trauma victim. And that parent comes in anxious, fearful, intense, maybe angry, has pressure of speech and or psychomotor agitation. And within 10 minutes, an inexperienced, non-PA savvy custody evaluator will likely think, well, no wonder the kids don't like her or him. This parent's bouncing off the wall. Moreover, many targeted parents feel uncomfortable and find it really difficult to respond to the tone of some MMPI2 questions. For example, a target parent may not know how to respond to a question. One being, people talk behind my back. Now, if that parent asks the evaluator, how should I answer these questions? Do I answer it in the context of the alienation? Well, typically, or what and, uh, the evaluator should say is, answer it in terms of how you feel right now. And some of them will also say, no, go ahead. If you feel you're alienated, then answer it in the context of the alienation. Now, when that happens, which, I mean, it's important that the target parent is clear in how they really do think or feel with regard to the responses of the MNPI2, but the evaluator can and does from time to time manipulate the results of the testing. Why, you may ask? Well, the MMPI2 says right on the front page that it can only generate hypotheses about the test taker. So it can be used for hypothesis generation, but not hypothesis confirmation. Now, hypothetically speaking, let's suppose that the target parent has a master's in computer science from an Ivy League university, works at a high-end shop as a computer scientist, is a team leader for other groups of engineers who report, report back to him. He's 54 years old. There's no prior history of psychiatric or mental illness of any type, at least not known. In other words, he's considered high functioning. Nevertheless, the evaluator ends up claiming the target parent may be having psychotic signs and symptoms, psychosis, paranoid delusions, and ideas of reference. There's no way this man should have been labeled the way he was. The pretest probability for a person that is a highly functioning computer scientist with no known history of these three psychiatric, psychiatric conditions is extremely low. So the bottom line is evaluators can make numerous cognitive errors and violate numerous clinical axions. A good, competent psychologist who is not a subspecialist in alienation or estrangement, at least 90% of the time will get it wrong or even backwards. Furthermore, the more severe it is, the more likely they're to get it backwards. And even the more experienced they are, the more likely they are to get it backwards. It's referred to as overconfidence bias. And to answer the last part of this question, that is how can this be mitigated? I'd recommend getting a well-experienced subspecialist in PA to offer expert witness testimony and similarly explain something similar to what I just did. Next question. 
Can the tests also be used to identify adult alienated children? Yes, and there is an adult version of the park that can be used to explore past childhood history and their perceptions of both parents. As adult alienated children are independent and can't be taken somewhere to have the test administered, somebody asks, is there somewhere that we or the adult alienated children can see these tests or can they be made public? The answer to that is the tests are given to the professional who is doing the evaluation and the evaluator has to contact Dr. Ronald Rohner. The average citizen cannot get these tests. Okay, Dr. Burnett, back to you. Okay, thanks Dr. Ray. So we have a couple more questions and a few more minutes. So I think this will work out fine. Um, so let's read this one together. I am wondering, if there has been any studies or information on toddler age children that have been alienated from one of their parents for several months or longer, can alienation happen at the toddler age? So my impression is yes, it can, but it, it doesn't look quite the same as with older children. That's because toddlers don't incorporate in a more permanent way their feelings and opinions that, uh, if they're one one parent, hopefully, if that's been a good parent, they're comfortable with that person. And then when they go to the other parent, hopefully they're comfortable with that person. So the toddler is less likely to incorporate the negative uh, brainwashing that parent A might give the toddler regarding parent B. I think it can happen, but, it, but it's harder to do. And it doesn't stick as well when they go uh, spend time with the second parent. Now, there is an interesting variation of this, which is what about a small child who's been, in a sense, brainwashed since infancy? In other words, imagine a, an infant and that parent A, and usually that would be the mother, takes control of the child and totally envelops and, and enmeshes her relationship with the child so that she and the child are totally dependent on each other. And the parent A excludes the father from the very beginning from the child's life. So that might look like, that does look, as the child gets older, that's going to look like a parental alienation because the child is going to reject the, the father without a very good reason. So this is a bit of an exception to one of those five criteria. If you remember, um, uh, I think it's uh, the second criterion is that uh, in the uh, Currently, the child doesn't want to see the parent, but in the past, the child had a good relationship with that parent. And so the exception is that if the child was um, uh, taken into possession from the very beginning and that the parent, the second parent, never never had a chance to form a relationship, then, then you don't uh, satisfy the second criterion, but you, that child might still be considered alienated. So here's another one. Uh, let's read this one together. What is the profile of minors and adults who fall prey to such brainwashing? To beat the odds of such cruelty, what can be done? And can schools do what can schools do to inculcate independent thinking? So these are all interesting topics. Uh, almost anybody, uh, maybe not so much really young children, but almost any older child or an adolescent or an adult, can be brainwashed or indoctrinated into having false beliefs. Adults happen, this happens to them uh, in a cult, that the cult gets a hold of the adult. They're vulnerable, perhaps at a moment when they're, they've had some sort of serious loss or, you know, for instance, suppose a guy that the girlfriend breaks up with the guy, the guy's unusually lonely. Well, he might be susceptible during those months um, to, to get in, getting involved in a cult just because he feels helpless and he wants support from somebody. Uh, I think children sometimes are more vulnerable. Uh, certain children, if they have anxiety problems, for instance, suppose a child has separation anxiety disorder, which is a known psychiatric condition, and uh, that child might be more susceptible to, to get, getting indoctrinated against the other parent because already the child doesn't want to leave parent A because of the separation anxiety. And so um, if you add the indoctrination on top of that, 
that child might more quickly become alienated. Th those are some examples of people who might be particularly vulnerable. But to really, to be clear, um, any, any person at, under certain circumstances, normal people, can be brainwashed or indoctrinated to have false beliefs. Um, it, it is interesting about schools. Uh, th th there are programs in school, and some schools have uh, counseling for certain groups of children, for instance, children whose parents are divorced or divorcing. So that's a nice thing to do if the counselor is able to do that, is to have group meetings for these children to help them get through a diff difficult time. And part of that counseling might involve helping the child not get brainwashed. In other words, you help the child have a good time with both mom and dad, and you help the child resist getting uh, influenced by one or the other parent in a negative way. You know, schools do educate children in a much broader way. A popular idea is critical thinking in both grammar school and high school to try to help children achieve uh, critical thinking, which means to be able to think for yourself and learn from your own experiences rather than be influenced by other people to think certain things. So I suppose that would be a nice thing to have that might make you somewhat resistant to becoming alienated. I think Dr. Ray has one more question and then um, we'll be wrapping up after that. Thank you, Dr. Burnett. Um, the question um, provided from the, uh, an audience member is, in the event of more than one teen child and one has told a parent they will not be coming to their home anymore, and the, this is a 16-year-old, with the assumption that the child is in the severe range of alienation, what is the best way to protect the other two from becoming alienated? Additionally, the audience member mentioned that the first child will not consent to counseling and any form of legal action increases hostilities and all children are at risk of becoming alienated from that parent. I can't give specific advice. I can only offer general advice with regard to this three-part question. But if I were the rejected parent, I would do my best to get in front of a judge and get a court order for that 16-year-old to enter into a four-day intensive reunification program like the Family Reflections Reunification Program or Turning Points for Families or any other good one. Court order stipulations must be made, including a minimum 90-day no contact order between the 16-year-old and the alienating parent. Now, in our case with the Family Reflections Program, we'd work with the 16-year-old and we'd also work with the younger children. Um, but the younger children uh, would be working with their team um, using uh, different kinds of educational modules that are based again on their own cognitive levels. But the main intervention would be with the 16 year old in helping the youth understand how important it is not to continue using alienation tactics and influencing the younger child or children involved. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ray. And thank you to the audience for participating in uh, this webinar today. There's an, uh, one more message we wanna give you, which is the following. If you are interested in learning more about parental alienation, think about joining the Parental Alienation Study Group. And this is our website, www.pasginfo. So, you know, there are a number of different organizations that. A focus on uh, advocacy or education or support regarding uh, this topic of parental alienation. And two big ones are family access. And we really appreciate the hospitality of Elaine Cobb in inviting us to give this webinar and making these arrangements. So family access is a really big organization. And so is parental alienation study group. We, you know, we, we both do a lot of things. We have the same ultimate mission, 
which is addressing this uh, psychosocial problem of parental alienation that affects so many children and families. You know, but we all these different organizations have slightly different ways of going about that. So thank you very much, Elaine, for having us, and thanks to the audience for participating uh, today. Good evening.